Hey friends, and what a blessed assurance it is to know that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and He reigns on His throne as King today. Amen and amen. Well, so glad that you chose to join us tonight for another Wednesday night Bible study, A Glimpse of God, uh, here with Troutland Baptist Church. I'm Pastor John, and I'll be leading our study tonight, uh, as we have been doing for several weeks now. We've been looking at the parables of Jesus Christ, the parables of Jesus, and tonight we're going to be continuing that. Uh, so I hope you'll grab your Bible uh, so you can read along with us in your copy of God's Word. Tonight we're going to be looking at uh, the parable of the ten minas, the ten minas as found in Luke uh, 19, uh, beginning there in verse 11. Verse 11. So yeah, we, uh, we, we, Jesus has so many teachings, so many uh, pointed lessons that we could learn, and tonight is no different. Tonight is no different. There was an occasion when the, the disciples and really the, the crowd, the, the people, even the Pharisees, were asking questions. You see, for the Jewish people during that time period, they were under the rule, they were under the government rule of Rome. And they didn't have a lot of freedoms. Yes, they could still worship in the temple, but they weren't recognized as their own nation. Uh, they couldn't have really their own king. Yeah, they had a king appointed uh, to them and for them, but it wasn't wasn't what they had hoped for. And they had hoped that the Messiah, who has been prophesied for, for many, many years, would come and set up his reign on earth, which he's going to do that. They were thinking that it was going to happen during this time period, during this time period. So really, this parable that we're going to look at tonight uh, really speaks and clarifies uh, you know, just what it is. When is the kingdom of God coming? But more importantly, uh, we're not to be concerned about when the kingdom of God is coming, but we're to be about the king's business. And that's really the key that we're going to look at tonight. So before we begin, let's go to the Lord and ask His blessings through prayer. Father God, we do thank you for loving us. We thank you that, yes, you are the great king. And, and what a blessed assurance that is that brings us hope, that, that brings us uh, assurance of our faith, that brings us assurance that you are with us on our journey through this life. Father, we have many in our fellowship who need assurance, who need encouragement, who just need a lifting up really a powerful lifting up that only your Holy Spirit can. I thank you. I thank you that you work through us, that we can be your hands and feet, uh, that we can even as times even be your voice. But most of all, Lord, may we show your love. May we be receptive to your Holy Spirit to lead and reach out and to minister to those who are in need. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, again, I hope you have uh, your copy of God's Word, and we're going to jump right off into this parable for tonight. Now, really, in, in order to understand this parable, you, you really have to understand what's been happening. And, and as far as Luke goes, Luke's account, and that's who we're going to be in tonight, for Luke, even in the previous chapters, just right before chapter 19, chapter 18, chapter 17, and, and even on up into 16, we can see that Jesus has been journeying, making his way to Jerusalem for the final time. Uh, Luke has been giving us many details about what's been happening. And, and Jesus, even uh, not too long before this, Jesus has for the third time even told his disciples that he was going to Jerusalem, that the Son of Man uh, is going to, to go and actually is going to be mistreated, insulted, going to be uh, beaten and, and ultimately crucified, and yes, would rise on the third day again. 
he has been teaching them this. Now, one of the things that we know leading right up to this, and, and really one of the things that, that pulls the need for this parable, the need that Jesus wanted to give this parable, was right before this. Yes, as he's making his way down through the region of Galilee and Samaria, He's already healed the ten leopards. Uh, he's, he's come into uh, Jericho. In fact, he, he healed a blind man outside of Jericho, and the crowds are just praising God uh, for this miracle that has happened. He, he makes his way in uh, to Jericho, and of course the crowd is still just praising uh, him, praising God. And Zacchaeus, that's where we're introduced to that tax collector, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, yes, he was that small man he was trying to get to see who this Jesus was that he heard was coming into the city so he climbed that tree and of course Jesus when he came by where Zacchaeus was he told him to come down because he was going to go to his house and have supper that day now you know one of the things that we need to understand and and that may sound a little bit presumptuous on Jesus uh, case and, and the way he was standing was, you know, it's, it's very cut and dry. Zacchaeus, you come down for today. I'm going to go to your house and eat. You know, Jesus wasn't inviting himself to there. In that culture, table fellowship was a privilege. It was, you know, many people felt it was an honor to have, especially someone like Jesus, uh, someone famous, someone recognized uh, to come. And, and it was there, and at that time, when, yes, when the uh, religious leaders, they heard that Jesus was going to go and eat, and, and then, of course, Jesus was proclaimed to be a rabbi, a teacher, a teacher, and, of course, he claimed to be, uh, you know, the son of man, the son of God, this religious person, and yet he was going to eat with a known Sinner, the religious leaders, wow, they just blew a fuse. They could not believe it. They could not believe it. And that's where Luke records Jesus' words, those famous words there uh, in, uh, in Luke chapter 19. He says, Today salvation has come to this house. Jesus told him because he too is a son of Abraham. And he makes this qualifying statement. And this is really, those, these two verses right here really give us the key uh, to this parable we're going to look at tonight. He says in verse 10 of 19, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. To come to seek and to save the lost. That's the reason he came. Because now you're going to have to understand... Uh, you know, why, why Jesus came. That's where we see in our text, in Luke, he, he, he moves the account straight from Jesus' statement right there into our text tonight. So pay attention. This is what we're going to do. If you have your copy, read along with me. It says, as they were listening to this, and that's this statement, he, he was listening as they were listening to Jesus uh, give this testimony about Zacchaeus, and, and Zacchaeus now believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the reason Jesus makes that statement, salvation has come to his house. It's come to his house, and this is the whole reason he came, was to seek and to save the lost. As they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear right away. Friends, verse 11 right there tells us the whole background, tells us the need, gives us really a look and an insight of what this parable means. It's going to help us explain it. When you understand what they were looking for, the Jews, they knew that the Messiah, when he comes to set up his Rain on this earth, it's going to happen in Jerusalem. It's going to happen. So now this is the, the third year of Jesus' ministry. He's making his way. There's been a lot leading up to a lot of events, a lot of God really showing himself. So the Jews were thinking, ah, could this be the time when the kingdom of God is coming? And since they were so close to Jerusalem, they were thinking that, yes, now is possibly the time. Here, just you know, today, tomorrow, maybe this week, the kingdom of God is coming. So he tells them this parable, and that's what he says there. Look at verse 12. It said, Therefore he said, A nobleman traveled to a far country to receive for himself authority to be king and then return. 
He called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas and told them, Engage in business until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent uh, a delegation after him saying, We don't want this man to rule over us. As uh, at his return, having received authority to be king, he summoned those servants he had given the money to so that he could find out how much they had made in business. The first came forward and said, Master, your mina has earned ten more minas. Well done, good servant, he told him, because you have been faithful in a very small matter. I have, now I'm going to give you authority over ten towns. The second came and said, Master, your mina has made five minas. So he said to him, you will be over five towns. And another came and said, Master, here is your mina. I have kept it safe in a cloth because I was afraid of you since you are a harsh man. You collect what you didn't deposit and you reap what you didn't sow. He told him, I will condemn you by what you said, you evil servant. If you knew I was uh, an evil uh, or a harsh man collecting what I didn't deposit and reaping what I didn't sow, Why then didn't you put my money in the bank? And when I returned, I would have collected it with interest. So he said to those standing there, Take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. I tell you that everyone who has more will be given. And from the one who does not have... Even what he does have will be taken away. But bring here these enemies of mine who did not want me to rule over them and slaughter them in my presence. My goodness, may the Lord add his blessings and his explanation and his insight to the reading and the hearing of this word. Of course, as I said there, the 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 real purpose of this parable and the hint to its meaning is is really found in in those couple of verses uh, just before there are verses nine and ten as well as you can see leading up uh, to this uh, day this event right here how in the people's minds you know they were thinking that uh, yes the kingdom of god is is getting ready to happen and as i said before the pharisees had already asked Um, Back in chapter 17, when the kingdom of God would come, and uh, Jesus, as I said, had already told them for that third time uh, that that he was going to to Jerusalem and, and would be portrayed, mocked, spit upon, flogged, and killed. But Scripture tells us there, it says that they understood none of these things. The meaning of the saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what Jesus was saying, was not saying. So again, the, the key comes in to here after declaring Zacchaeus saved, and Jesus plainly said, I have come, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Knowing their hearts, knowing that they just did not get the reason why he was here, the why he was here. He was going to give them this explanation. You know, they didn't understand God's plan, the plan of salvation, where by believers, we as believers, Jesus was setting up a system. He, as the king, was going to be setting up a system where his servants, we as believers, his servants, would carry on his ministry, his work, carry on, be about his business, if you will. A lot of those key phrases and those key words just plug right into what we're supposed to be doing for Jesus. So really, I guess in a technical sense, the kingdom of God had come. It had come when Jesus came into this world and ultimately will come again at his second coming, at his second coming. Well, we see here, yes, that that Luke records the progression of uh, the disciples' understanding of their purpose, which we even see, you know, as as Jesus was making his way 
up to the mound uh, there in Acts chapter 1, uh, right before he was to ascend. The disciples even asked them again, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? And of course, Jesus tells them, you know, it's, it's not for us, it's not for them, man, to know when uh, the time comes. But their job would be to wait on the Holy Spirit for the coming of the Holy Spirit to come on them. And then when the Holy Spirit comes on them, He will lead them. He will direct them into what they needed to do. And they did. They did. Uh, one of the great things that we see that uh, shortly after that, over in chapter 2 of Acts, we, we read how the disciples, yes, they got right to the king's business proclaiming who this Jesus is. When the Holy Spirit came on them and boldened them, they started speaking to everyone who was gathered uh, there in Israel on that day of Pentecost. And we know that over 3,000 people uh, were added to their number as believers. And then later on, over in uh, chapter 3 of, of Acts, we see that uh, the, the disciples again were even more emboldened and they're speaking out to the religious leaders. They were finally getting it. They understood what their business was. They understood what Jesus' purpose was. Yes, He is coming back again. But they knew that they had to be about His business until He returned. Well, we look down here in verse 12 and we, we see really some uh, analogy, some comparison that, that's being made there. It says in verse 12 there, A nobleman traveled to a far country to receive for himself authority to be king and then return. And of course, that's just hinting to Jesus' ascension. You know, when Jesus, yes, Jesus, he's God's son. He's Lord over all, Lord of lords and king of kings. But when he ascended to heaven, he became king. He sat down on the throne uh, at that time. And yes, he is going to return. He is going to return. And he will have an accounting of us as servants. So that's what this parable is, is, is showing us. It's showing us there's going to be a time period. Right now, we're in the in-between. Yes, the nobleman, Jesus has gone, and he has uh, been made king, and we're waiting on his return. But he has given us, before he left, he has given us something to do to carry on business to carry on business and when he comes as we say yes we'll have to give an account to give an account over here in verse 13 uh, you know he makes reference about these these ten of his servants gave them ten minas and told them to engage in business until I come back and and the the, the ten servants really is is just servants it is not really to relate to anyone in particular definitely not the disciples because at this time there were twelve disciples and then shortly after this there's going to be eleven disciples and then of course there's going to be many more disciples because many are going to be added to it. So what we can read in here is these, these ten servants are just us. They represent us as believers. Us as believers. And again, uh, we're to be about uh, God's business. Yes, Luke. Uh, Luke mentions the, the uh, menace here. They were given an amount of money. And the amount that they were given really amounts to about three to four months of uh, the average person's daily wage. Uh, so, yeah, not, a, not a, a huge sum, but not really. I mean, it was still something to uh, take aware of, to take note of. Uh, they were given a pretty good gift right here. They were given something that they were to invest in. Friends, we all have been given a great gift, and that's called salvation. Wow. It's an invaluable gift, a priceless gift. And we are to be using it to be put this gift into service uh, for the Lord. That gift of salvation. Wow. The rewards that are to come will be out of this world. Uh, they're going to be heavenly. They're going to be heavenly. The big question is, and what we need to be challenged with, is what are you doing with the gift that you have been given? You know, this parable goes on to make the point 
that two of the servants uh, did well with what they were given. However, we see an example here of the one servant who did not invest the money that was given him, did not invest you know, the gift that was given him. He held on to it. He held on to it. And you know, one of the things we need to understand here is, friends, our salvation, that gift that's given to us is, is not just simply fire insurance. It's not simply just to keep us from, from going to hell. It's given to us for a purpose, and that is to be actively serving the King, Master Jesus Himself. Because really, Scripture tells us that, you know, if we're, if, if we're going to understand who Jesus is and, and we understand the love and the forgiveness that was shown to us, then we're going to be busy. We're going to share that good word. That is an example. That's a demonstration of a true believer that we're going to, we will be one who will share. We will invest that gift that's been given to us into others, into others. So again, that's one of the things that we need to understand. We are to be fruitful. We are to be fruitful. And that's what it means to love others or to love as Jesus loved. We're to be about his business, not just sit on that investment, not just to sit on that investment. Well, down here in verse 21, we, we kind of see an example. When, when all the servants come in and this, this master has come back and he's calling account um, to all of his servants to see who's done what, this third servant you know, tries to explain himself. He says, because I was afraid of you, you're a harsh man. You collect what you didn't deposit and reap what you didn't sow. My goodness, even with this testimony, this testimony just shows that this servant, he did not really know the master, nor did he trust him. Because he's making this accusation. In fact, the master even says here, I'm going to condemn you by even what you said, because if you think this, if you think that I'm a harsh man, that I mistreat people, what did I just get through telling to these other two servants? Look how he blessed them. Obviously, he's not a harsh man. Obviously, he's a very generous, very loving man. As I said, the actions and the attitude, this man from this servant, this wicked servant, out of his own testimony, just proves that he did not know uh, who this master was. He didn't have a relationship with him. He did not really know the king. And therein lies the problem. And therein lies the, the proof and the, the, the reason why the king doled out the judgment that he did. You know, some probably think that this sounds a little bit harsh. Uh, and, and in fact, a lot of those in, in Jesus' close association, they were no different. There are those, even during Jesus' day, real close association, that did not truly understand who Jesus is. They did not know him nor trust him. Think of Judas. Think of Judas. Also, Matthew records Jesus even saying, uh, gives this great example here. And this is talking about being close to Jesus or in association with Jesus. Listen to Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. That will is to invest to be about the Lord's business, to invest that gift that we are given. Verse 22, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. You see, a true disciple of Jesus is going to know Jesus. Jesus is going to know them. I know my sheep, and I call them by name. I call them by name. Does the Lord know you? Are you his servant, or are you just associated with Jesus just for the benefits that that association may give you? Look at verse 27, and he, he kind of wraps things up here. He says, but bring here 
these enemies of mine who did not want me to rule over them and slaughter them in my presence. You know, this statement really uh, pictures the Jewish religious leaders and anyone else who opposes Jesus. These are not those who were just in association and, and didn't follow, didn't do Jesus' will. These are those who outright oppose Jesus. Those are the ones that he calls his enemy. You know, anyone who opposes Jesus outright, they're going to meet the same fate in judgment. They will be cast into the lake of fire. So in summary, we this parable really mentions the fate of three groups. We see the faithful steward and they receive a reward. We see those who were just in association with Jesus, but they didn't really know him and trust him and they are rejected. Then we also see the judgment for the enemies, those who outright openly reject Jesus. You know, Jesus gives and he presents an opportunity for forgiveness. There is no neutral ground. There is no middle ground. Jesus says you're either before, or for me or against me. If you're not for me, you are against me. You can't take a neutral ground. You can't take a neutral ground. Friends, doing a self-examination, which are you? Are you that faithful servant? That faithful servant where we will hear that, uh, that great saying, well done, faithful servant, just as these two servants in the example here were given. Or are you one that's just in a close uh, association? You come to church, you do churchy things, you do religious things. Do you really know the master? Do you know the king? Do you have a relationship with him? Friends, I sure hope, I sure hope you're not the one who just out, outwardly and outright reject Jesus. He loves us. He died for us. All we have to do is just confess. Yes, yes. I mean, everyone at one point uh, is an, was an enemy. All believers at one time were an enemy. The only way, we, only way we can be right with Jesus is to acknowledge that, confess that to Him, ask Him for forgiveness, and for Him to guide us and to work through us. Friends, that's what it's all about. Jesus tells us that we need to engage in business until He comes back. God bless. Let me pray for us. And we'll go out into this week. Father God, thank you. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you that you are our Redeemer. And you live, you live today and you are coming back one day. Father, I just pray that you, even right now, that you touch hearts. Touch hearts to draw them close to you. Even those that are in association with you, Father, that they may not really truly know you, convict them in their hearts. That they can come to know you. They will surrender to you and be in full service, faithful service, investing your gift into others, into this kingdom while we wait on your return. Father, I just ask your Holy Spirit to speak to those hard, cold hearts that do not even know you, that you even will turn them around just like you did many of these religious leaders. Father, we know, we know that the, the road to the kingdom of God is narrow. That gate is narrow and few find it. But the road to destruction is wide and many travel upon it. Oh Lord, may they, they who travel that road, may they have the opportunity to hear and to know Lord, you tell us that you are, you make that your truth known. May we be about that business to help those that are going waywardly see and know you. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. And this week, as we go about, if you travel that road that is least traveled, don't worry about being lost. Don't worry about not knowing where you are going. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, He knows where you're going and He will direct your path. God bless and let us not forget to be kind.